Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the St. Clair chapter of the Daughters of the Kings Fall Retreat. Um, thank you for coming. We hope you'll enjoy the presentation today, and um, we invite any feedback. Of course, this is the first time we've done this virtually. So this is going to be a new experience for all of us. Um, but we, we invite your feedback. So please, at the end, if you would leave comments as to how you, uh, your evaluation of the conference today, I'd appreciate it. We start off with our, um, the song for the order, Lift High the Cross. Oh, there's no sound. No, oh, man, there's no volume. Um, I need to unmute it, maybe. Um, I think so. Oh. One second, I apologize, everyone.
We will now have the prayer of the order by Bertha Spadone, please. The prayer of the order of the daughters of the king. Almighty Father, you have sent us your son to teach us things pertaining to your heavenly kingdom. Give us blessing to our order wherever it may be throughout the world. Grant that we, your daughter, ever may discern your trust and bear and bear the cross through the battles of our earthly life. Give us strength to overcome temptation and the grace to work to spread your kingdom and to gather your scattered sheep within your fold. Pour out upon us the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit that we may always remember it is your work we are called to do that all things, all we think, do, or say may be pleasing in your sight. We ask it all in his, for his sake, our King, Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. The motto of the order, Carla. For his sake, I am but one, but I am one. I cannot do everything but I can do something. What I can do, I ought to do. What I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. Lord, what will you have me do? All right. And the introduction of our guest speaker for today uh, by Selena Carter. It's an honor to introduce the Reverend Deacon John Shepherd, who is a member Deacon Dawn was a baby of 20. She was called to be. She resided in town. Deacon Dawn was a baby of the school church in 2017 while living in Missouri. Since moving to Houston, Bishop Dawn licensed to Deacon Dawn to serve in the Diocese of Texas and She is happy to serve as a deep place. She is a spirit seeker. The deep loves public school, spirit with the church. This has been the best in worship. It done. Now we joyfully welcome. We, we can't hear you you're muted now Did she i think she was i think she completed it oh okay. correct yeah okay she kind of i couldn't hear her toward the end yeah welcome to well, good morning thank you thank you cecilia Thank you everyone for um, this kind invitation to come and talk to you um, about a challenging subject. So go ahead, Colin, let's move to the next screen. There you are. Yeah, there it is. There's the mission impossible thing, yeah. staying connected in troubled times. So, I had said this earlier, and I'll say it again, that this is not a sermon, this is not a speech, this is a presentation, and if we were together in person, I would be able to see you and say, yes, you have a question. Um, so please, if you do have a question, if you want more information about what I'm talking about, if something's not clear, you want to talk about a situation, we are going to be talking about relationships. So during this time, as we get started, think about the relationships that you have and think about the challenges with some of those relationships 
as well as the love in so many of the relationships. So let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Colin, Colin's doing the PowerPoint for me. So um, who are we in relationship with, right? Who are we connected with? We start, I think, with the members of our family because they're the ones that have to put up with us. <laughs> we live with them or we see them regularly and they are, um, for most of us, the first relationships that we, that we have to deal with. Then we have friends that we are dealing with. Uh, some of them are good friends. Some of them have been friends in the past, but we move away for whatever reason. Um, sometimes we develop new friendships. So we also have people who, Colin, I don't even know what the next one is. Coworkers. Yeah. So I was writing this. I was thinking about in myself, all the people that I know, my family, my friends, my coworkers. But then I was thinking about people who are in our lives that aren't coworkers, and that's community. So even if you're a teacher, you the children or people that you're teaching are not necessarily your certainly you're not your coworkers, but they're your community. And then we've got strangers because the people that we see at the grocery store or the fast food or the people that we don't know their names, but we still have the connection with them. And then we have a connection with ourselves. This can be a challenging one. We all think, yeah, yeah, I'm really connected to myself, but it takes a pretty much daily practice to be in touch with what's going on inside of us and how we are feeling ourselves and in the world. And then, da, 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 God, right? We have a connection with God. It's not always strong, and sometimes it's very powerful. So as we're thinking about the connections that we do have and how we work with them and through them, we're going to talk about how we stay connected. How, H-O-W, how, how we stay connected. And that is in the next screen, da, 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 da. the how, honesty, open-mindedness and willingness. Because my experience shows that when I am working with these three tenants, that I have a better relationship with people, I have more more of a solid foundation and I know how to move through them and with the relationships, the connections that I have. So we're gonna start with honesty, which is the key to the honesty. All of us, I think, believe that we are pretty honest, right? Especially good churchgoers. We always think that we're honest and, and I think for the most part we are. Um, most of us don't outright lie and yet the hardest person to be honest with is ourselves so when we're talking about relationships when we're talking about being connected with people what is my motive what is my purpose so I'll give you an example I'm going to go visit my mother right my mother and I have had really good relationship at times and in the past oh I don't know 15 years and in my personal journey, it's because Fox News has come into our life in 24-7. So we have a little more struggle in our communication. So if I'm going to see my mother because it's my duty to see my mother, then when I'm with her, I'm just going to feel that burden. I have to go see my mother. I have to. I'm her daughter. I have to go see my mother. But if I can change my motive. If I can decide before I enter into the next conversations with her, what do I want to be with my mother? What am I looking to get out of this time that we're going to be together? And if I can say to myself that my motive for this time for me to go visit my mother is that I want to hear some stories from her childhood, because when I can take her back there, she is kinder and more gentle. And I want to connect in that deep loving way. So if my motive is to be with my mother in love and in kindness and deep listening, then my motive is different than if I, yeah, it's my duty as a dutiful daughter, I have to go see my mother. 
And this is for all of our connections, all of our relationships that what's my, why am I here? Why am I involved with this person? Is this something that I need to do? And am I feeling pressured from that need? And if I can change my motive to make it more interesting, to make it more loving, then I'm going to have a different outcome when I'm entering into that relationship, when I'm having those conversations, right? So honesty comes a lot of times with just, um, I hear, hear so often people say, I'm brutally honest. Ow, oh, please don't be brutally honest to me. I don't want brutal anything. I want you to be honest with me in a kind way. I need to be honest with you in a kind way. I have, um, I've spent the past 20 years working in this way, this honest open-mindedness and willingness in relationships, in all of my relationships. And it took me a long time to be able to talk to people and say, have challenging conversations with people and not be a jerk, right? Um, another example with my mother, because she's not ever going to see this, so I can use the herb, <laughs> is that um, she had asked me one time for something that I was not prepared to do. And I told her that I wasn't going to do that. And there wasn't any reason for her to ask me that. And then when we hung up, because of course she got mad at me, I called her back and I said, mom, I'm, I apologize for the way I spoke to you. I needed to tell you that I had a boundary with that issue and that I'm not going to do that, but I needed to be able to say it in a kind manner because none of us, none of us wants to hear somebody say, you should do this and you should do that. And blah. You start pointing the finger at me, I'm just like turning around. But if you come to me in kindness and say, you know, I'm, I've been struggling with this. I'm having a little trouble with this and I'd like for you to hear me. I'm going to listen. So kindness always has to be met with honesty because otherwise it's just cruel. So the question, right, is this necessary? Is this relationship necessary? Because through the years I have realized that there are some connections that I've had with people that out of a sense of duty and there really wasn't any joy in that and that I just needed to let that relationship be. Then I need to ask myself, is this time that we are together necessary? And is the what I'm going to say necessary? Because I used to talk all the time. And now I can be more quiet because I don't necessarily need to tell you something. And if I can't say in kindness and if I'm not being honest, then it's certainly not necessary. So when we're looking at staying connected honesty needs to be right up there and it's not easy we think it's easy and we think that this is absolutely you know i'm an honest person and this is it, but we really need to look deeper to see honesty am i being honest with myself am i being honest with you and i'm being honest with god because a lot of times we think we can pull one over and it's just not possible. So if we start with honesty and keep it kind, we've got a good basis for staying connected. And then we move on to open-mindedness. Staying open. The quote there, listen with the ear of the heart. That's from Benedict of Nursia. So when I learned this through the Episcopal Church many years ago, if I can hear you when we're in conversation, if I can listen with my heart instead of my judgment, then I have a better chance of really understanding you. So often when we speak, when we're in a conversation with somebody, we say our piece and then they start talking. And the first thing we do is start formulating what we're gonna say in response, right? They start talking like, oh, well, let, as soon as they stop, shut up, I'm going to say this and this. So we're not really listening. It is a great spiritual practice to really listen. 
not with judgment, but with our heart to listen to people that we don't agree with. It's easy to listen to people that are speaking our language, that are telling us the same thing we want to hear because, yeah, please do, you're preaching to the choir. But to really listen to people who we are on opposite sides of the political spectrum, who we see differently, this is a great tool in staying connected, to being open-minded, to being so expansive that we allow others to share their thoughts with us without judgment, right? And then <clears throat> be curious. Curiosity is the cure for judgmentalism. If I see you and I think, I know what kind of person you are, I'm judging you. But if I'm curious, I'm going to be able to understand you better. So if someone you're in connection with, someone you're in a relationship with, and you're like, oh, just they're just driving me crazy. I can't believe that they think this way. I can't believe that they do this thing. Like how, how do they even get there? Ask, be curious. Tell me more about why you see it the way you do. Tell me how you got to that conclusion of what you believe when we ask questions open-ended questions right not yes or no that just shuts us all down but when we can ask questions of I'm curious about how you chose this path I'm curious how you decided that this is the direction you're going to go whatever it is whatever situation you're dealing with ask instead of determining Instead of judging them, ask them. Because when we open up, we might not agree. I'm not saying you have to agree with people. Goodness, no. But we still need to be able to hear. We still need to be curious. Right? When Jesus healed people, oftentimes he would say, what do you want from me? What are you asking for? He did not, he knew, right? Blind man comes up to him and says, uh, you know, Jesus. And Jesus says, what do you want? He was curious because we need to hear what other people are trying to tell us. And if we assume that we know what they're going to say or why they believe what they believe, then we're not able to really know the entire person. So what can you learn? Because I tell you, some of the people that are what I originally think are so far away from me, I can learn so much from them. I often learn more from my mistakes and the hard situations that I find myself in than from the easy ones, right? But everyone is my teacher. Everyone teaches me. Sometimes it's because I see people, I'm like, oh my gosh, you are do. I want to be just like you. You are doing exactly life the way I want to be doing life. And sometimes I encounter people and it's a reminder for me to pull out my mirror and to reflect, am I acting this way? Is this how I am? Because if I don't like it, do I have these same qualities? I have a, a patient at the hospital currently who is on my last nerve <laughs> and I know why because she knows everything she has the answer for everything and the reason I struggle with her is because that's how I once was not so much there anymore but whoo there was a time when I knew the answer to everything and I would tell you and I didn't hesitate and it was hard and it's hard for me to see that, but it's a good reminder. So I can learn from every person. All right. Willingness, willingness. Here we go. Am I willing? Do I want to keep this connection? What am, to what length am I willing to go to keep this connection, to deepen this connection? Oftentimes, I think we just get into a habit, right? 
oh, well, I always go over here on Tuesday and I always visit with this person at this time. And we always talk about this. Well, is this what I need? Is there a way that I can strengthen this connection so that I have a better understanding of this person? Because if I'm not willing to do it, if I'm not willing to be open-minded, if I'm not willing to be honest, then I'm not going to go very far. And the willingness is all on our part. In order for us to engage in a deeper way, I have to be willing to take my armor off, as Brene Brown says, and be vulnerable. And it's not comfortable. But it's the only way we can have a deep relationship with anyone is to be vulnerable, to ask questions, to stay honest and open. And this is how you do it. We ask God for the willingness. Right? Whenever I'm going to have a co hard conversation, I want to first start with asking God to keep me open, to keep me available to the other person to let me listen with the ear of the heart. Because if I don't start with asking God into the conversation, I'm not going to have a good conversation. I'm going to run it. And if I'm running it, I'm probably gonna run it into the ground because that's just how I do things. <laughs> so let's have a pause for a moment and see if there's any questions or, or comments so far. Y'all may unmute at this time. Dawn. Carla. Hi. Um, I'm really surprised by some of the things that you've been saying, especially about your connection with your mother, which <clears throat> I had a difficult connection with mine. And part of part of the difficulty is having, for me, was having the, a very visceral response to some of the things that that she said. And it's how do you, I mean, that, that kind of response is very hard to turn around, you know, even if you're willing to and going through years of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> it's very difficult. But how do you do that when when you have not just you know family member but somebody who is so like throwing daggers at you mm -hmm. that you just totally mm -hmm. want to retreat, mm -hmm. but you feel it's important to keep that connection. How do you kind of? safeguard yourself or whatever I don't know those are great questions Carla and it is it is a challenge um and usually the closer we are to people the more painful their comments can be to us somebody we don't know or don't care about we're like whatever but words can be very powerful and very painful and if I can remember that spiritually healthy people do not intentionally hurt anyone else if I can keep that in mind, then I can recognize that someone who is saying hurtful things to me is not spiritually healthy, that they are in pain. In the, in the social worker circles, they say hurt people hurt people. And I found this to be true. And I know this from my own experience. The only time I'm ever a complete jerk is when I am just, I'm not good, right? I haven't, I haven't prayed. I haven't meditated. I haven't studied myself. And so I'm taking it all personally. How could you say that to me? Why would you say that to me? I can't believe you, you would hurt me that way. Ooh. Or I can remember and think about and have grace for this person thinking, wow, you must be in so much pain mm. to be saying these things to me. And if I can get myself into that space that you are in pain, I may have the opportunity to say, what is troubling you? Because you seem to be, I sense that you're really angry and I'm not sure what it is that I have done to create this anger. 
Right. I want to say something. Cecilia, do you have something? Yes, I do. Uh, when you brought up curiosity, mm -hmm. um, I got a message from Lauren uh, because she attended the spring retreat, which was crossing the difference divide. And we had the presentation from uh, Pat Graham and uh, Rose Ebaugh on the three-step method. And you start out with, I'd be curious to know. She brought that up when she saw the curiosity thing out there. And I thought, you know, that's a good point because um, when I'm speaking with someone, especially a family member that has a different viewpoint on something than I do, I don't really probe the person to see why she or he has that particular viewpoint. I make my own assumptions. <laughs> and I guess that's not a good thing. I should do be more curious and say, I'd be curious to know why you feel like that. Or, you know, I, I have not done that. And I don't know if that would change anything, but I, I intend to do that now to be more curious about how people who have different ideas about things come to those conclusions, so. Yeah, and thank Lauren, you, Annette. Excuse me, Lauren, if you want to say something about that, feel free. Uh, I guess you know not. That <laughs> yeah, that sums it up. I really enjoyed that process. I think it is effective and was great to learn that that day. Um, and I recommend it. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, and here it is again, right? And it's not necessarily going to change anything about your stance or their stance. But when we're curious, we at least open it up to say, hmm, this is an interesting thing. I don't have to agree with you. But if I allow you to share with me the reasons why you're feeling this way, the reason why you are choosing this, then I have a little bit of comfort and I've made you comfortable instead of just automatically judging because that's how I used to go. My mother would say something and I'd say, well, you're just wrong because blah, blah, blah. And haven't you read this? And don't you understand this? And how do you blah, blah, blah? Because I wanted to tell her how she was wrong and why she needed to see my point of view. But that's my ego. And if I can just say, well, I find that interesting. Please tell me more about how, uh, why it is that you believe that this situation should be different or whatever it is, right? Whatever we're talking about, if I could stay curious, if I could ask questions, then she gets to explain to me and hopefully I'm going to be able to hear her. And sometimes when people have to explain why they feel a certain way or why they've chosen a certain way to go through life, they have to really think about it. Hmm. Because otherwise it's just, well, this is what I do. And this is how I think. And this is how we go. And doesn't everybody do this? It's like, well, but tell me really why you are going there. Yeah, it helps them go deeper as well. And maybe they'll see it differently. Maybe not, <laughs> but possibly. How about in any other questions that are coming up? So there is one in the chat, Dick uh, and Don. Yes. Or I guess more of a comment. Uh, Chantel, did you want to speak on that or would you like me to read it? Um, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll uh, read it. Um, you were talking about deepening relationships, Dawn, and um, I've noticed about myself um, that I've found that I'm perennially not the sort of person to call people on the phone and yak with them, except for what I would call um, business reasons i.e. I have something specific I want to say to them or ask them. I, I don't tend to just call and, and yak like, you know, friends yak. Um, and um, I, I feel like that distances me 
from them and I feel like it distances them from me like they don't think I'm interested and it's like I am interested I just I I, I don't know um I, I think it all started when I was a little kid and I had this friend who would call me every single day and I just got to the point where I didn't want I didn't have anything to say and so now, um, I, I don't know, um, I'm not quite sure how to uh, bridge the gap, I guess, how, how to make myself more, um, come across as more friendly and more caring and more interested in other people's lives. I, I don't know, it's, it's, it's very um, difficult. Well, you know, Chantel, I think that um, some of us are more extroverted and more comfortable striking up a conversation and others are more introverted and like, mm, no, not unless I really have something to say. So, and that's okay. We don't all have to be chatty Cathy's, right? And yeah. I am one of those people that I, you know, I talk to people in line at the grocery store, but that's just who I am. If you want to, make connections with people, then start with that. Call somebody up and say, hi, um, I'm trying to deepen our relationship. And I just want to say hello and say, see how you're doing. Doesn't have to be a deep, involved, long conversation. But if, you, if we're honest and say, you know, I, I want to get to know people in my community a little better, and this is how I'm starting you would probably be surprised that people are like, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you for calling me. Gosh, that's so cool. I would really like to get to know you better, Chantal. Remember, these are things that a lot of us feel, but we're too afraid to speak it because we think we're the only ones that feel that way. And we're not. There's a whole bunch of us out there that are like, wow, I'd really like to get to know you, but I don't know where to start. Start right there. Be honest, say just that. I, I see you at church or I see you in business or I see you online. And that just really, you, you seem like an interesting person to me. And I'd really like to know more about you and about your life and to see if we can make some more connections. And that's a perfectly valid way to start the conversation. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Are there... I wanted to talk to something about what Carla uh, mentioned of how to protect ourselves from people when they're being um, hurtful. And I'm in a situation with my sister who at a very early age decided that she hated me. And so we've had a, a relationship going off and on, off and on for, you know, for all of my life. Uh, where we've had good times and then she just whacks me back and rejects me and it's just so painful and I've just gotten to the point now where I've always had to initiate a relationship with her and uh, so finally I have just decided I'm not going to initiate with her anymore and I'm just going to wait for her to respond to me or reach out to me and then uh, respond back in just as brief an amount of conversation as I can um, until, you know, she decides she wants to have a relationship with me because she obviously doesn't. She just wants to be able to have power over me, I think. That's, that's quite, uh, quite a situation that you've got going there. Have you had a curiosity conversation with her? Have you had the opportunity to say, you know, from the time I was young, I really felt that you didn't like me. And I don't know if I'm making this up or if this is something that I'm just perceiving from you. And if so, I feel uncomfortable during the times when you say such and such to me. And I'd well, like to we, know yeah, what- we, Yeah, we have had that conversation. And so that that's- uh, we're both aware that, that that is part of the dynamics. 
And so um, I, I don't know, I think um, I, I feel good about where I am now with this relationship that I, I've set boundaries. And uh, if she wants to, you know, continue to reject me, then I will just, you know, um, make the point very clear that this is what she's doing. And do, does she really want to continue to do that? Because I don't want to have that relationship with her. So uh, I, you know, I've just, I've just had to do that, you know, for myself. And that's perfectly legitimate, right? That yeah. it is not some, none of us, none of us need to subject ourselves willingly to the pain of somebody that's unhealthy. Right. And if she is unhealthy, when she has a conversation with you, it is um, your right perfectly to say, you know what, I'm just, I'm not feeling comfortable in this situation with you, with what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. Again, right. Speaking honestly, but doing it in a kind way. And part of that, from my experience, is using uh, I statements. I feel hurt when I hear you say X, Y, Z. I have been struggling with being in relationship with you because the last time we had a conversation, you X, Y, Z. So the mm -hmm. Right. The ability to not say you did this to me and you made me feel this way and it's your fault and blah, blah, but to say, to keep it on ourselves. I really struggle with mm -hmm. this relationship. I would love to have a good, healthy relationship with you. And I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. If she's willing, right, right, to be in relationship with you, then it's perfectly well for you to say I want to be in relationship with you and I'm not going to be able to do it when you say these things or yeah. when you bring up these things right right and then it's her choice yeah and there are there are, there are sometimes when a relationship just needs to be quiet my uh my older brother and I he called to wish me happy birthday on my birthday great I will call to wish him happy birthday on his birthday if he makes it but it's just we don't, I don't converse with him. I don't call mm -hmm. him up just to chit chat. Mm -hmm. We don't have that relationship. My little brother, on the other hand, we talk regularly because we have a better relationship and I have to be okay with that. Would I love to be just a loving sibling? You know, do, do I, do I, uh, do I envy, right? These people like, oh, they have family reunions and everybody seems to get along and it's also loving. And that's not my experience. Right. Just because we're family doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be besties. Right. It's and and if I'm okay with that, that's good. I have to be okay with it. If your sister wants to be in communion with you, then it's up to her to be able to, to say, all right, Norma has set these boundaries. Norma has said, you know, do am I willing? to be that way when I'm in conversation with Norma. And to remember that, again, she's in pain for whatever reason, yeah. I mean, she, yeah. you just don't dislike someone unless there's some pain inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I'll be able to do that with her now. In prayer, right? Always, 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 you know, I always ask God, please, God, speak through me. Let me just be the conduit. Because if I'm in charge, I'm going to screw it up <laughs> from the beginning, right? right. I have, a, I have a, a friend uh, who's in the Native American tradition, and he always asks creator to let him be a hollow bone to just let the flow of the creator comes through him. And I love that image, right? That just let me get out of the way. Cause if I'm in charge, you know, I'm going to say things to piss people off, right? That's just, that's my go-to. But if I am letting God speak through me, then I can sit there and in the love of God and be okay. And here's another little trick that I've learned when I have to, to talk to people that's like, oh, I don't want to talk to this person, that I am to imagine that person standing there, sitting there, Jesus with his arm around that person. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah. What am I going to say to that person if Jesus is sitting next to that person, holding that person tight? How am I going to respond? What am, am I going to be a jerk? Hopefully less so, <laughs> right? But I believe that to be true, that Jesus is next to each and every person and in every person. And I try to see it, right? The love of God, that spark of God inside of them and focus on that instead of focusing on their shortcomings. And our shortcomings are so much easier to see than our love, right? So, yeah. Oh, we're at an hour. Let's go ahead and have a stretch, y'all. Um, we'll take a short break. Um, let's say we'll meet back at 10, 15. Does that sound good? Okay. Stretch, get a cup of coffee, go potty, whatever it is you need to do. Can we and converse? We'll be... Lisa. Yes, converse. <laughs> I'm going to. How are you doing, Lisa? Unmute yourself. Are you coming home for Christmas? Oh, I'm muted. Am I not muted? I'm not muted. No, you're not muted. Not there you know. <coughs> Maybe she's yeah, got no, to Lisa sleep. is still <laughs> muted. And she may oh, have gone there back. She, oh, there she is. Okay, I'm, I'm on. I'm just mm -hmm. going me. When, when will you be home? Um, I, I should arrive on the 20th. Whoa. Yeah. The 20th of December? December, yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm sorry? Well, I'm hoping this year will be better than last year. Um, hmm. I'm not sure. It's still it's still a long trip. A uh, long journey. Where are you, Lisa? I'm in Utiavik, the most northern city in the United States in alaska oh wonderful oh. what do you do there oh i'm a i'm, I'm a school teacher oh wow she's 29 to 33 miles north of the arctic circle yeah i think i think even last year i was still above the arctic circle oh you were i didn't realize that I think so. Yeah, because I thought, I thought, oh, I'm in the Arctic Circle. No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, yeah, I'm definitely above it this time. Well, you're way up above it now. They've had polar bear sightings. Oh, me. How many, how many months out of the year do you have snow on the ground there? About ten. Mm -hmm. Um, probably. Um, this is my first year here. Um, oh. snow. The snow came in September. It came in mid-September, and, and then they said it'll be here when I leave in May. Wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. And then you have days where you have no sunlight too, right? Oh, those, those are approaching um, the sun. The sun sunrise is about 11 now, and it sets at Is it, it might set at four. Wow. So that's about, that's about five hours. And I don't know, yeah, the, the, the sunlight still um, is diminishing quickly now. I, you, you sense it more. Wow. Four, four or five hours. Five. Do you need anything? No, they, um, there's you can get I mean you get everything that you can pretty much it just costs a little bit more it takes a little it'll take forever to get here so I'm good what's the population of the town you live in here um this one's a little bit bigger than some of the other places this one's 4,500 people I don't what's see 4,500 people I'm sorry your next question what was the name? What's the name of the town again? Um, it was formerly Barrow. If you look at, um, oh, thank you. Very good, Chantal. Yes, Utiavi. Oh, wow. Is that a Russian name or something? 
I don't, I didn't look this one up. I'm not sure. Oh, you know what? Um, before it, it was, um, here was named after, um, there was some fellow named Barrow. I don't remember his first name. And, um, and the, um, what's happened now that there's this um, resurgence where the people want to reclaim their, their, their lands and their, their town. So they renamed it to Utiavik. And I don't remember what it means, but um, they did that probably, it was only a few years ago. It's probably been about four or five years ago. Cause like the airport's code is still Barrow, BRW. And then um, most people, they, they, choose not to call it Utiavi. They keep referring to Barrow and even like you could put on the, because um, I guess it doesn't matter on your mail, it's, you could put Utiavi or Barrow and it still gets here. Or like there are certain things like I've ordered, like magazines and some other stuff I've ordered, they don't recognize Utiavi, so I still have to use Barrow. But um, like I said, the name um, I do it should be um, I think Inupat, which is the um, the people and the language that's spoken here. Is that Eskimo? Is that American Indian? There, um, these are as far as I understand, they might be um, they're Eskimos, and then they come from Russia. There's some people that have come from Russia, but not not everyone. Because some of the names, someone told me some of the names are Russian, but then, and what's interesting too here is that I think the names are more, these, there's a lot more native names here, whereas last year when I was in, um, I don't know, I think that was like maybe 300 miles south in Kotzebue, they had a lot more, they had a lot more standard American names, like I had an aide, his name was Jones. Chris Jones. And then there was like people like Wilson and Williams. They had they had standard more, I don't know what you call, I don't know, those standard names. Whereas here, like I, you could look on the roster and you'll see names that, that um they maintain more like like I said, more the native names and I guess more the native culture here. Mm -hmm. Do they need more? I bet they have a hard time getting teachers there, right? Oh, that absolutely. That's not not just them. Um, every everywhere. Um, like like, pretty much. There's a lot of jobs here, so if you need somebody that needs a job, like they they're they're pretty much open, and they it pays well. You just like said if you put up with what the cold and like this time I have polar bears. Well, I didn't see the um. Last year there was caribou. I didn't see them, and I'm well, hoping not to see the polar bears either. But uh, <laughs> there might be an issue. <laughs> Nothing like putting the trash out and getting eaten by a polar bear, huh? Uh, yeah. um, apparently, it's a big deal because I was um, I've been walking the work, and um, people told me that I may want to go ahead and pay for a cab, and I'm like, um, maybe not, not yet. We'll see. I'm hoping that um, if I stay on the main road, I'm hoping that um, where there's cars that they'll stay away from the car and the traffic, so. Really? What would make a polar bear afraid of a car? <laughs> the, um, I would think the noise, no? Uh-huh, okay, sure. Well, I think you ought to, you, they pay you enough, take a taxi. <laughs> okay, well, I said, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, we'll see. Oh, the walk, the walk is good for me, though. I repeat, they pay you enough. Take a taxi. Oh, OK, all right. Well, yes, yes. Yes, Yvonne, you know better. Yeah. So to teach there, would you have to be certified to teach? Like I have a friend who's she lost. She was a teacher and then she lost her license. And now she's struggling to get recertified. Um. um they're probably pretty open there, aren't they? They're very flexible as far as that. But um, like, for instance, 
that's a question for HR. I don't, I don't know. She can apply. If you, um, someone could give you my information if you send it, if you send me, and I can send you a link. Okay. For where I am. And there's, I mean, there's, um, there's a whole lot of stuff I have to get used to and, and I'll be, you know, and I've been honest with anyone and I haven't been able to convince anyone I know to come here. So <laughs> um, I, I hope I, you keep, um, you're keeping a diary, Lisa, I've told you this would make a great movie. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I keep telling you that. Um, I agree. I second. That's this picture. So. There's some people who can't get to live in the cold. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, like I said, I'm not out there playing in it. There's there's some people that came here. Um, like what's interesting, they um they what the local school union they took a survey and and what was the primary reason that you wanted to come to this particular school district? And one of the options was oh the the the, you know, the chance for adventure. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not the adventurous type. So I'm not out, like I said, I'm not there. And then, and some of you have, and you've asked me, I'm, I'm not out there playing in the cold. I said, I, I've walked to work. It's, um, what's the weather? It says it's 18 degrees right now. Wow. I'm not sure what the, oh. um, what the, no. what the real field temperature is. Well, I said, I'm not playing outside right now. I'm not gonna, I'm not, there's no reason to, because like, there's, of course, like I said, polar bears looming and, and it's cold outside. So there's other people that come, I said, they enjoy what they like, the hunting and the fishing. And no, I'm not doing that. Because um, if I wanted the adventure, I would probably would have stayed in the first place I, I came to, right? Mm -hmm. Which is Quat Lake, which was very remote. And it was very remote. And then what did I complain about? I complained about everything, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and here's not so bad, because of course I wanted to be where Alaska Air flies. How far do you have to go to an airport? Oh, like I said, here it's close. Um, like it's um like it's in walking distance. I could walk. So to I the have airport? to decide. Airport? Yeah, oh. I, it's not it's not, it's not a it's not a traditional airport they have um well they use, looks like airport hangers that they use is like gates as opposed to a standard building and it's a you know long runway and even um like the first community i came into when i came here to alaska they have they all have airport codes but there was no airport it was just a landing strip yeah. and that first year um when I wanted to come home for Christmas was an issue because the, um, I call it the bush planes, those, I don't know what they call them. They call them twin engine crop planes or crop planes or crop dusters, people call them. Um, it wouldn't land. Um, I missed, and, and I'd end up missing my connection with Alaska Air in Bethel, which is a more established um, town because the um the um what was the oh um they they said that no one cleared off the the, the landing strip so um i insisted i wanted to be where alaska air flies and then that brings you a little bit more i think civility i think Whereas like, like if you wanted a real adventure, yeah, go, go in those remote villages where someone invited me to come join them. They needed what, there's only five teachers there. And one of them was the principal and he wanted, he needed like all the staff, they quit that to the, what would have been this school year. They didn't have, he had to find somebody and he asked me to come. I was like, Alaska Air doesn't fly there. No, sir. He's like, oh, you can get to what they, what do they have the internet in the housing? 
Alaska Air does the fly there. No, I don't want to do it. Thank you. I'll go where Alaska Air flies. Okay. It's good to hear from you, Lisa. We miss you. No, I'll be home soon. Yay. And you were just talking about um, that you have the boundary around you're only going to be where Alaska Air flies. And Norma, in, before we took our break, we were talking about setting up boundaries with your sister, which takes us to the next slide. <laughs> good connections require good boundaries, right? I mean, it is something that we have to have because otherwise we're just all muddled up, mixed up. What's mine is yours, what yours is mine. I don't know where we have uh, an ability to say no. And if we don't have the ability to say no, then our yes isn't necessarily a really firm yes. So boundaries, boundaries help us with that. And I didn't learn boundaries as a kid. That wasn't something that I understood growing up. So it took me into my adulthood before I could realize it. And as the graph shows, right? The only reason a rainbow has its beauty is because the colors don't all intermingle. They're very separate. They're very distinct and it's good, right? I think it's uh, what the poet Robert Frost said, good fences make good neighbors. And when I first heard that as a kid, I thought, well, that's just terrible. We shouldn't have fences. We should all be able to go over to wherever we want to go. And it's like, ooh, but if you've got a mean dog, you need a good fence to keep your dog out of my house. And boundaries, if we're not accustomed to using them are really hard. Because so many of us, particularly those of us who are church people, we have a tendency to be church people because we're helpers. We love people. We want to be there. We, want, we, are, we are called to be in community. We are called to be with other people. And so we are givers, which is beautiful. And sometimes we just have to say no. And no is a complete sentence. No is the ability to say, that's not going to keep me healthy, right? Norma, you were talking about your sister there, you know, I, I can't have this trying thing where every time we have a conversation, I'm in pain. No, that's good. Don't do it. If the situation is, changes and she's able to adhere to your boundaries, awesome. If not, that's her choice. We all have choices when it comes to this because of the boundaries. Lisa, right? I heard you say that I'm not going to go there. Alaska Airlines doesn't fly. That's a boundary because otherwise Absolutely. you're putting yourself out. And I used to be the kind that I would say yes because you asked me to do something. And then I would do it and I would be so mad at you. I didn't want to do this. I didn't want to have to be here, you and your stupid idea. And here I am having to, I could have said no. However, so often, if we're yes people for so long, and then we decide to say no, people say that we're selfish. Well, you used to do this. You were always this way, right? When I started setting boundaries, I got a lot of pushback because people expected me to just give up whatever I was doing and participate in their game. And I don't do that anymore. I will participate if it is something that I want to do. If I'm willing to do that, I'll go. I'll do it. Let's do it. And you know then, if I'm there, it's because I want to be there. Not because I'm feeling pushed or pulled. It's because I've chosen to be there. And if I choose not to, I'm okay with that. Well, I can't believe you said no. Well, here's an opportunity for you to believe that I said no. <laughs> here's an opportunity for you to find someone else that may play along with you. Here's an opportunity for you to see things in a different way. Because if I'm not taking care of myself, which I completely believe that boundaries are self-care, 
if I don't do that, I'm just going to be mad all the time because I don't know where I can go, where I can't go. And so uh, to me, a good example of how poorly most of us struggle with boundaries. When I volunteer for something, I say, oh, I'll help you with that. People will say, and you may be one of these people, and I used to do, are you sure? I'm sure. I wouldn't say yes unless I were sure, right? But we never trust that people say yes and really mean it because we very rarely hear a no. And the more we are able to say, mm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do that right now then people know that when we ask or when we agree to something that our yes really means yes because they've heard us say no. And one of the best ways that I understand visually, because I'm a visual person, you see my little rainbow there, a visual person. The way I think about self-care as opposed to selfish is flying on an airplane. And when they tell you that if the airplane loses altitude and the oxygen mask will drop down. And if you're traveling with somebody who needs help, you don't put the oxygen mask on them first. You put the oxygen mask on yourself first because if we're not breathing, we can't help anybody. And too often, all of our yeses, all of our, oh yes, I'll do that. And they're <laughs> exhausted, we lose it. Valerie, you wanna say something? Um, uh, could you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I was saying, you know, I, I found that um, with regards to boundaries, as I get older, I think I say more no a lot more. Because yeah. I mean, I mean, when I was younger, I was yes, you know, yes, so yes, you know, I, you know, because I wanted to please people. Absolutely. So now as, as I get older and I'm thinking, I said, you know what? I need to put myself first. So I'm gonna say, no, I'm gonna be selfish. Well, and see, and it's not selfish. When we put ourselves first, I don't think it's selfish because if I put myself first, I'm taking care of me so that I am able to be there for you. Selfish, right. I think, is when I put myself first and I don't care what happens to you, you might as well just, and you're not that kind of person. I know you to be right that you will say, I can't do that. I say no, because I mean no, but it doesn't mean that you don't love me. It means that you're taking care of yourself. And if when I need you and you are healthy and you are in a good place, then you're going to help me. But it's no point in us trying to help somebody else if we're depleted, right? So I love it that you're saying no. And I think that the reason as we get older, it becomes a little clearer, maybe a little easier, is because we have a better idea of our values, because that's what boundaries are based on, right? And when I know what's important to me, what my values are, if I value time with my family, then I have to tell work I can't stay there until eight o'clock at night because that's my value. So that creates my boundary. Right. So when we, and, and as we're young, I don't know that all of us have the good concept of what is really important to us. I think some people do, right? And I, I'm, I know some young people who are really good at that. But for me, it took me getting older to understand what was really important to me so that I could put in a good boundary. Beyond you saying something? I, yes, I had the opposite. I didn't have to learn how to give boundaries. I had to learn how not to put a moat around me. <laughs> because, I mean, I came into this world with a sense of, this is my world, welcome to it. Well, that's the opposite. You know, it, it was like, if it wasn't what I wanted, then we didn't need to do that. And I had enough confidence in myself and I had enough space in my world, I just go home. Well, I do have boundaries and I, I put it in the chat, I haven't sent it out. But one of the strangest, once I first started saying no at church, my husband would go, how could you say no at church? Well, it's easy. One of my strongest boundaries really always surprises people. I will not carry 
and crucified. We will walk in with nothing. <laughs> but I just, it's like something I just internally can't do. And so I'm not going to do it. I think I have carried it one time. Now, y'all know I've been to church a lot. <laughs> I've been a lot of processions. I think I've carried it one time. And it's the last first time, only time in the last time. But people look at me really strange when I say, I'm not doing it. I'm sorry. Not happening. We'll just walk in and have a service because God will still be here. But I had to learn how to say, this is my balance. Now, I would say, like you said, it would be really ugly. <laughs> so you're telling me that part of your learning has been to um, be able to have <laughs> kindness with your honesty. Right. Right, and to temper, yes, that's what my learning was as I got. It. Yeah. yeah, and that even moats have bridges. Yes, right, even moats have bridges. <laughs> There's still a moat now. Have no fear, we got a moat. I do have boundaries. <laughs> but the bridge is much wider. And it's a lot easier to get across. But the moat's still there. And that's good. It's there for protection. And Norma, that's what we were talking about earlier, right? With your sister is that you need to feel safe. Yeah. Boundaries help us feel safe. Without them, we don't know who's coming over. You know, Beyond's mm -hmm. got a big old moat. She knows, you know, <laughs> unless she puts that bridge down, nobody's getting to her. They're being the alligators in the mucky water, as Drake would say. Right. right. I promise. Yeah. yeah. Norma, do you want to say something? Uh, no, I'm okay. Well, I guess what it, what it was is that uh, finally the pain got so intense that I finally decided I had to, you know, put up the moat. Yeah. And sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes we we keep giving and we keep giving and we keep giving until we're just taking our last breath if we don't say no. Yeah. But hopefully what we're doing here today is talking about finding ways to make good connections, to keep good connections, and the connections require both and. It's not just you in the relationship. It's not just me in the relationship. It's both of us. That's the connection. And to maintain healthy connections, we have to have a boundary. Um, I was, uh, when I was first in discernment for the diaconate, the Bishop of Western North Carolina said that, um, bishops, uh, that, um, deacons are like the fire, right? The flame we are, we're alive, right? We, we want to do things and we've got these ideas and we're burning, we're burning with the spirit. And he says, the Bishop is the circle that keeps the fire safe, Right. Because a fire is wonderful when it's contained. It's dangerous when it's not. Similar things for us with our boundaries. I have to know when I need to back away because your boundary says you've heard enough from me. When your boundary says, I don't want to hug. I'm a hugger. I miss. I'm, I'm so This pandemic has just messed me up so hard because I want to hug everybody. But I know that there are people who that's not their comfort zone, their boundary. They need that physical space. And in order for me to maintain a connection with that particular person, I have to have that space with them. That's my gift to them is to not impose my gorgeous self on everybody <laughs> because not everybody wants it. To respect other people's boundaries is just as important as having my own boundary. Right. So tell me, good people, what are some of your boundaries or where are you struggling with a boundary? Because sometimes, you know, that's that's what we need. We just need to put it out there and talk about who challenges us and why. And when we've got a group of people like we do, we can certainly come together. And Colin, if you want to go ahead and put us all on the uh, on the view of everyone gets to see everyone. I don't know the text. There we go. There we go. 
So anybody want to talk? Boundaries are my favorite topic. Boundaries <laughs> are your favorite topic? They really are. They're my favorite topic. Because I have lots of friends who need to learn to put up boundaries. I put them up. I, I, I you know, and y'all notice that. Um, I put them up in my personal life. I put them up at work. I put them up at church. I, I came in knowing how to put up a boundary. I just had to learn how to temper the boundary. But I have so many friends who need to learn to say no. Now, not that I don't get in trouble, because sometimes I have so much stuff on my plate, I go, wait, 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 wait. Somewhere along the line, I've got to say no. Mm -hmm. I was on the Virgin's board. I was a, the, the Virgin at church. I was, I'm the senior warden. I was on the Bishop's Committee. I was on something else and something else. And somebody calls and said, would you like to be the regional director of, I'm going, I don't think I can put that on, on, on my plate. Uh, so no, I, maybe come back in two years. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I don't get in trouble <laughs> with saying, okay, I can do that, I can do that. And then you have to stop. And go, mm -hmm. yeah. But mine is because I have so many friends that I have watched that need, I said, look, if you can't say no to those people, send them to me, I'll say no to them. You know, because you need somebody to say no, because you can't do it all. You know, boundaries is one of my favorite topics. Amen. Lori, do you want to say something? I see you're off mute. Yeah, um, you're talking about boundaries. Is I learned a very hard and painful way how to set boundaries is that my mother and I had always had a strange relationship anyway. <laughs> and at one time she went, when I needed her help, she went way, way, way over my very weak boundaries and I mean, decimated me mm. truly and completely. Mm. And I wrote her a letter and told her that she was my mother, so I loved her, but I didn't like her very much. <laughs> and that I would be in touch when I could handle it. And we did not speak for close to two to three years because I had to learn to set boundaries. Um, we were so far apart that she wrote me a letter back and said, well, I didn't say that stuff. and. It was like, whoa, people heard you say that stuff. And so it was <laughs> a very hard thing. Um, once I was a, I don't know how we started talking again. I really don't remember that part. But once we were able to start, it was, God was moving in this relationship like you wouldn't believe. It couldn't have been a year later that she announced, she called me and said she had lung cancer. And the doctor had given her, oh, I think it was three to six months to live. And um, Chuck and I were living in Miami at the time and she was in Fort Worth. And about that time, Chuck lost his job and we ended up moving to Houston, which it's a lot easier to get to Fort Worth from Houston than Miami. And I could be up here a lot in Fort Worth after that. and. We did a lot better, a whole lot better. It was still painful for me at times, uh, but I grew. God was with us, with me through the trip with that. She came to rely on me. I used to work with hospice and she came to me a lot more than the rest of the family and stuff. So it was a good thing I had my boundaries set or I couldn't have done, I couldn't have made that walk with her. Exactly. And it's quite possible that because you have that boundary, she was more comfortable with you because she knew, right? Once we establish these boundaries, once we tell people this is what I'm willing to do and this is not, people are like, oh, okay, there's no guesswork about art. Do you really mean it when you say it? Well, because if people say yes, but really mean no. My, my thing is, is when I ask, when I need something and I ask someone, 
and I, and I will tell them when I ask them, it is very important. If you don't feel free to say no, don't say yes, because it, it can't be an honest answer then. And just to see the startled look on their eyes, you know, that it's important that you can say no, because then I can believe your yes. Exactly, exactly. Thank and, you, thank you, Lori. Cheryl, did you, you, you're off mute. Did you wanna say something? No, but I do understand about mother issues. <laughs> <laughs> Lord family, <laughs> right? Family is, I, I think they are our most challenging sometimes relationships. Sometimes they're our most challenging relationships and sometimes they're just our very best relationship. We're- If I could just say something to Norma real quick. Sure. You and I need to talk. <laughs> we need to talk about sisters and help each other down this road. Okay. So I would like that if we could do that. That was yeah. all. I'll, I'll take all the help I can get. Yeah, no, you're <laughs> going to give it to me. Forget it. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's that. awesome. Awesome. Yeah, great connection. Bertha, yeah. what are you going to share with us? Well, what I want to say about boundaries is I don't have a problem saying no. It's, I guess it's my personality. When I say no, people are shocked of, oh, how, how can, how did she say no and manage to say no and keep it no? So um, again, this, this will go, this is with my friends, but my no means no. When I say yes, I do what I say yes for. When I'm having an issue with is my kid. When I say no to my boys, especially my middle boy, he think I'm awful. I'm an awful mother because I said no, and it's not what he wants to hear. And I found that with him being a struggle. Because like you said, if I don't go into my inner self and open the house of God and dip my head in there and come out, it's gonna be a little bit yucky. So again, it's all the prayers. Sometimes I just have to go shut down and ask, what should I say? Or oh, I'll go that thunderstorm, nothing will happen, but my nose still is still no. Where it comes to a problem is when that no get broken. I don't know how to handle that section. That's my problem. I need help with that. When that no, my no is no, and it get broken. It get broken into pieces. I don't know how to handle that. So what I'm hearing, is that uh, when you tell your child no, and then they go ahead and do what they're gonna do. And I played that role for many years because I was that child. It's like, don't tell me this. Maybe we uh, all did, but yeah. 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 Then, then perhaps it's more of a conversation with curiosity. Tell me what, what caused you, what were you thinking when you decided that to go, I had said no to this situation and yet you, you chose to do it anyway. Tell me what, uh, what was in your heart at that time? What, what was your motive for choosing to go against what I had said? Right. And sometimes it's that conversation. Um, I know for me as a child, the thing that used to just upset me so much was my mother she'd tell me to do something and I'm all why do you want me to do that and she because I said so that's not a reason that is not a reason that's not a reason if my mother had said you need to do this because if you don't do this it's going to really upset me I'm going to get a headache I'm going to get angry and then we're not going to have a good relationship I would go oh well I don't want that to happen right I see the motive behind what you're asking me to do. If, if you, if, if she, she didn't do that. She just said, I said to do this. And this is the only thing you need to know is I said, no, no, actually I need more than that. And I tried to do that and still try to do that with my children, that this is the reason I'm saying this. There's all, because there is always a reason. And so, oh, yeah. and in doing that, I have to look within myself, right? I'm asking you, you're, an example, when my kids were still in their car seats, my little girls, 
in the back of the car and they were arguing. <laughs> I'm like, you guys stop arguing. <laughs> stop arguing now, I'm telling you. And they're like, why? Why do we have to stop arguing? And it was that because you're giving me a headache. And if I get a headache, I'm going to get really angry and we are not going to have any fun where we're going because I'm just going to be upset. And they're like, oh, oh, well, okay. And maybe that's what he needs. I'm not, I, I don't know the situation, but I know that if we're curious, right? All right. And open-minded, then we have a better chance of establishing a connection or deepening a connection to say, I think we've lost some of our ability to, to really talk with each other. So let's, let's go back a few steps and see if we can figure out what's going on here. And sometimes it's just being a teenager and re revolting, right? I'm just not going to do anything you tell me because I'm a teenager. Yeah. Oh, I Where the hell are you I'm going? going? <laughs> <laughs> this it is my business. <laughs> it's all a challenge. Relationships are not easy. Right. Connections are not easy. Right. A relationship is a full-time job. Oh. <laughs> right? Relationship is a full-time job. But if we remember that we're in relationship because we love this person, then it makes it a little easier, right? We um, ask God to be there with us. Who's saying? Chantal, is that you? Yeah. Lauren, who is that? Chantal can go. Go ahead. Oh, well, Lauren, if you wanted to say something, go ahead. You have already said something before. <laughs> oh well no mine was a question um well, go ahead and ask okay well thank you uh um i'm curious if folks can or deacon don anyone who wants to shed some insight on my question about the balance between being open-minded and the boundaries you know of, of course, and of not only physical, like the limits of what you can do and loads you can take on, but uh, emotionally, em emotional relationships, as well as, uh, of course, spiritually. But just curious about that. Right. Good, good question. And for me, it is the idea that I want to be open to hear what you have to say does not mean I have to agree with it does not mean I have to, uh, you know, I may still think you're out there. <laughs> but if I'm open about it, I can at least say, well, you know, I, they actually said what I was thinking about them. So I know them a little better. If I'm not open, if I'm not curious, then I'm just assuming that I know what's going on. And, and, and I love the way the word assume is spelled in English because it mm -hmm. makes an ass of you and me, right? A-S-S-U-M-E. So when I, if I'm assuming, oh, well, you're, you're doing this because you've always done it because of this and this and this, I'm, I'm putting you into a corner. But if I say, you know, I'm just really curious because I've been telling myself the story that you're saying this because of this. Tell me if I'm anywhere in the neighborhood, right? And if what you are saying and what your true beliefs are, are painful to me, then, then it's a boundary. It's like, okay, well, thank you for sharing that with me. And now I don't have to say this, but now I know that you're not a safe person for me. Right. Cause some people aren't, some people just are not emotionally, uh, psychologically safe for us because they will try to damage us. And usually it's family members. And usually they don't really know that they're doing it. They just know that they have just you're, you're such a such a little spoiled brat that they're always going to, they, they don't see us grow a lot of times, right? So they, they still think that I at them. And it's like, I'm not that person anymore. <laughs> Again, we can stay curious. We can ask these questions and, and help them maybe get to understand us some more. And if they're still that way, it's a boundary and that's okay. Stay safe, all right? Does that help a little bit, Mom? Yes, thank Anybody you. Anybody else wanna share on that? Um, yeah. You know, that the spiritual, in that spiritual world, the most clueless people I know were the disciples. <laughs> you know, when, so, 
how much patience, forget that I'm trying to tell you I'm the son of God and, and I can do miracles. How much patience did it take for, for Jesus not to just shake them and go, okay, wait now, you have been going around the countryside with me, not in another room, not in another, with me. And I still have to tell you this over and over again. Sometimes, I'm not telling y'all that I'm really good at this. Sometimes I try to take some of that. I'm going, okay, look, if he could take those clueless 12 people and turn them into 11 <laughs> of the, the most, uh, the, the strongest army uh, in his defense, then I can probably take this one person and try to do the same. You know, I can try to help them on their road. But there were still boundaries. He had boundaries too. Get the behind right. me, Satan. He said that to right. Peter. He had boundaries, right. So it's not all boundaries aren't ugly or hard. Like I said, that was part of where I had to learn how not to be like that. But he had boundaries. Boundaries make a kind of gentler world, not a chaotic world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Vian. Chantal, you're up. Um, how do you handle maintaining a friendship when medications are getting in the way? Um, I, I've got a friend who's been on psychoactive medications for quite a while. And it's gotten to the point where I, I feel like the drugs have stolen my friend from me. And I also feel like, you know, I, I'm usually a person who feels like I need to um, I need to talk to a person where they are. And I'm not able to do that with her. And I think it's because I miss the way she used to be and I'm not. I'm not used to, and I'm maybe not willing to get used to um, the person she is now. And, um, you know, how, how do you deal with something like that with, um, I mean, you know, it's not a, it's not an Alzheimer's change. It's, it's just somebody who used to, you used to be able to talk and have a conversation with is now very uncommunicative. You know, one word answers. How are you doing today? Fine. You know, I, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> how, I don't know how to maintain a connection. Yeah, that, that really sounds like a tough situation because it's what I'm hearing is you say that your friend has gone through a personality change, not for the better. Um, and well, sometimes it happens and it, you, I hear you, what I heard you say is that you believe that it's the medication that your friend is on? Yes, I, I, be yeah. I, I believe that, you know, it's, yeah. And again, that your friend has, um, is making choices. And if the, the choices are your friends to make, and if they choose to continue down that path and it no longer is a viable relationship for you, then it's a boundary that you have to say, well, you're not the person I used to know. And the person, if, if you met that person as they are right now, would you be friends with them? If that's, if that's a no, then maybe you need to allow that just to rest. They may yeah. come back, they may change, they may not. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's just, she used to be interesting. She used, mm -hmm. to, she used to express her feelings and there used to be give and take. And now it's just, I, 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 I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how to bridge that. And you may not be able to. Right. You, it may just be a time for you to grieve the loss of the friend as you knew them mm -hmm. and then let them just be because we can't change people. Oh man, I just hate that. <laughs> 
I want people to change. I, I have the answer for everyone. I have a beautiful script written for you. If you would just, we are on page three, you pick it up from here. But no, no, people don't do that. They live their own lives without listening to me and following along my very good advice. <laughs> <laughs> and you know and that just, the people um, they're just going to be people and some, you know I mean? sometimes they change for the good i did mm -hmm. 20 years ago got sober changed my whole world sometimes people change for the not so good and sometimes you just gotta may just love the person as birthdays. they were and then move on what's that beyond you may call on birthdays and christmas and mm -hmm. or just send a card periodic and that'd be it but the mm -hmm. the emotional relationship just is not there and you can't make it there i lost a friend that worked like that and i mean it is still today and it's, at, it's got to be 30 years ago and i still don't know what happened to the relationship you know because we had no big fight we had no but it just died and so it yeah. took me a while and i just had to own up to well okay i saw her 30 years later and she's like, we like the best of friends. I go, what happened in that 30 years? Well, you know, where, where were you anywhere in that 30 years? But it just, you know, it just may be, you know, but you don't have to give up your friend in your heart. Mm -hmm. But that that close relationship, it just may be gone. And it may not. It may come back. I sure hope it does. You know. Thanks, Mia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, all right. Let's see. Let's move on to the next one. Colin, let's see where we are. Staying connected in troubled times, right? I don't, you know, it's all troubled times. <laughs> all the times I think are troubled now, the seasons. Yeah. So honesty, open-mindedness, willingness, the Trinity, right? The Holy Trinity right there. I love this representation by Kelly Lattimore, this icon that she's written. Um, these are how I do my best relationships, right? When I want to have a connection with somebody, how am I going to do that? How, H-O-W, how, honesty, open-mindedness, and willingness. When those three things are in play, then I'm going to be able to be in conversation. I'm going to be able to have a good connection. And that's going to be a good relationship, whether the times are troubled, whether they're joyful, whatever it is. But these are the things that I have to maintain in order to stay connected. And that's to everyone, to my family, to my friends, to my coworkers, to strangers, to my community, to my church, to God, to me. I have to, I have to be honest. I have to be open-minded and I have to be willing to be in this. And I'm going to close out my portion of this program by reading something from the Book of Common Prayer. So we're going to um, have a little prayer for the parish. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Almighty and ever-living God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful. Arouse the careless and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life and bring us all to be of one heart and mind with your holy church through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with me today. Um, I think we've got a song and maybe a prayer for the, is that it, right? And then if if there's still people who want to hang around and converse, Colin, if you tell us that's okay, we'll do it. And if you tell us our time is up, we'll <laughs> we'll do that. So let me let me thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this. And uh, I hope we've all learned a little something as we move through staying connected in troubled times.
Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to be together. We thank you for Dawn and for the blessing that she is in our lives. We thank you for Colin, for all that he does to help these challenging in, um, systems to work for us. We thank you, Lord, for what we have learned tonight. And I especially am thinking about the importance of listening, that we listen to the Lord, we listen to one another, and, and that we listen to what we are saying to ourselves, and that we give all of this over to God that we can reach out to one another in more acceptance and love. And we just pray for healing for all of these relationships that have brought so much pain that can bring life to all of us. So at, we ask you, Lord, to help us reach out to others in, in ways that bring life and healing. Bless us now as we move through our day and as we have contact with those people who we love so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chantel, for the beautiful music. Thank you for everyone for your participation. Whether you spoke during the, the time together or just did that good job of listening with the ear of the heart, I thank you all for being here. I thank you for being part of my community. And I hope that we continue to learn and grow in Jesus' love. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dawn. All right. I don't know if we have any time left. I, I thoroughly enjoyed the program today. This was our first time with a Zoom retreat. And I think it went quite well. Yes. Um, um, Please add your comments so that we'll know um, your evaluation of the, of the retreat. I'd like to briefly say that remember tomorrow is BIM day at the church. So bring your canned goods. Um, and wire that, hangers. Wire hangers for <laughs> the Afghan refugees. Um, so please. Um, and I don't know, Colin, if we're out of time. If anyone would like to stay on for discussion afterwards, feel free to do that because we haven't seen some of you in quite a while, but this is the retreat for today. Thank you.